Hello, everyone, and welcome this evening to our talk. My name is Dave Carvalho, and I am the Senior Director for Youth, Young Adult, and Family Life here in the Diocese of Fall River. We're so glad you can make uh, some time tonight uh, during this Lenten season. Uh, as most of you know, during this, uh, this year, uh, Pope Francis, Holy Father, has called for a year dedicated to St. Joseph, beginning December 8, 2020 to December 8, 2021. And as part of that, there's a new interest in a call to the consecration to St. Joseph. We're very pleased and happy tonight uh, to welcome uh, the author of, of the consecration to St. Joseph, uh, Father Donald Calloway. Um, so just give me one second. I'm going to bring him on our screen. All right. Father Calloway, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, great to be with you. Great. Well, thank you so much for going on tonight. Um, so I'm just going to introduce Father Calloway, and then uh, we will turn it over to him as he will lead us this evening in learning how to live the year of St. Joseph. So for those who aren't aware, Father Calloway is a convert to Catholicism, and he's a member of the Congregation of the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception. You might be familiar with them as Marian Fathers out of Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Uh, before his conversion to Catholicism, he was this high school dropout who had been kicked out of a foreign country, institutionalized twice and thrown in a jail multiple times. But after his radical conversion, he earned a bachelor's in philosophy and theology from Franciscan University of Steubenville, a master of divinity and a bachelor's of sacred theology from the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, DC, and a licentiate in sacred theology and Mariology from the International Marian Research in Dayton, Ohio. He has written many academic articles and the editor of two books and the author of now eight books, including uh, The Consecration of St. Joseph, the wonders of the spiritual father. So without further ado, we turn it over to Father Calloway. And again, Father Calloway, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you, my friend. Yes, so I'm uh, very excited to uh, be with all of you. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of your evening with me. So let's uh, start with a prayer to St. Joseph. And um, many of you, I probably you probably already have the book. The prayer that I'm going to take uh, read comes out of the book. It's on page 245, if you have the, your book. It's the prayer to St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, my favorite title of St. Joseph. So let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Joseph, Terror of Demons, cast your solemn gaze upon the devil and all his minions, and protect us with your mighty staff. You fled through the night to avoid the devil's wicked designs. Now with the power of God, smite the demons as they flee from you. Grant special protection, we pray, for children, fathers, families, and the dying. By God's grace, no demon dares approach while you are near. So we beg of you, always be near to us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, my friends. So what I'm going to do um, this evening is I got a, there's a lot of material that I want to cover and I won't be able to cover it all. Uh, so get a copy of the book because everything is in the book. I'll be telling you things that aren't in the book as well. But I want to make this presentation basically in uh, four kind of steps or, or, or phases. So I want to cover some history because, uh, you know, in order to understand why we have this year of St. Joseph, um, it's, it's important to give a little context to that and what built up to it, um, because, you know, it's, I think it's important to do that. So I'm going to talk about first some history. That's the first thing. Don't worry. I'm not going to bore you. I know when somebody puts up, a, you know, hands like, OK, point one is going to be this. Don't worry. You won't be bored. I promise. History. We're going to do that. And then I'm going to talk about the era of St. Joseph, meaning like the time of St. Joseph, which we are living in right now. That's going to be the second phase. And then I'm going to talk about specifically the year of St. Joseph, which is kind of like the crescendoing of this time, this era of St. Joseph. And then we're going to talk about the concrete application or something to do. And that's going to be point number four, which is going to be the consecration to St. Joseph. Okay, so let's back up. All right. Many people have asked me, they said, Father Calloway, how did you write a book so thick, and it's a big one. I mean, it's about 300 pages. If you have a copy, you know, it's, it's not a small book. How did you write a book, Father, about a guy who didn't say anything in the New Testament, right? 
it's a good point, right? Or some people have said, are you just making this stuff, Father? You know, you just winging it here. You know, how do you know this stuff? Well, um, yeah, it's true that uh, we don't have any words from him in the New Testament, but obviously he spoke. Uh, so where do we get these things from to know about St. Joseph? Well, you know, as Catholics, we believe that divine revelation, God's revelation of himself to us, comes through three sources. Uh, the scriptures, that's the primary source, you know, the Bible. But then we also have sacred tradition uh, when the popes speak to us in authoritatively in their writings and, and, and teachings. And then we have the magisterium. So those bishops in union with uh, the pope teaching us the, the faith. So we can get a lot, actually. And I, I've done all the work for you. I, I've gathered everything. I spent three years of my life, actually, traveling the world, gathering all this information from all these different resources to put it into the book. And it's fascinating because I have to say, you know, um, I have prayed to St. Joseph since my conversion. I've loved him. He's helped me so much. But I myself really did not know St. Joseph that well. Outside of, you know, throwing out some prayers here and there to him, asking him to help me, I asked myself the question about four years ago, St. Joseph, who are you? Because I really got a sense that we needed St. Joseph in this time of crisis, right? So much going on in the world and even in the church. We need St. Joseph today in, in a big way. But who is St. Joseph? Because I bet you, I bet you like me, that um, you probably in the artwork that you've seen him depicted in, classic pieces of art that are beautiful, I bet you that 90 to 95% of the images that you've seen, he's been depicted as old. And I mean very old. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Old age, of course, absolutely not, right? But is it true that St. Joseph was an old man when he married Our Lady? Is that true? Most people think that it is because that's how they've seen him depicted in uh, the artwork. But has the Catholic Church actually taught that at any time? No, it hasn't. It, it, it is not the teaching of the Catholic Church that St. Joseph was an old man when he married Our Lady. Well, where does that come from then? Well, because we don't have a lot about St. Joseph in the scriptures, no words, but just his actions. And I'll, I'll tell you a minute about some possibilities of how St. Joseph got in the New Testament in the first place. It's pretty fascinating. Why did people depict him as old? Well, there developed these uh, what are called apocryphal sources in the, in the first centuries of the church, which are people basically trying to fill in the gaps because we have those whole hidden years of the life of the Holy Family that we don't know much, a few episodes. So they thought, well, you know, we don't know much, and we definitely know that Mary was a virgin, a perpetual virgin. This is the teaching of the church from the very beginning. So we better present St. Joseph as being an old man. That way, nobody's going to think that anything happened in that marriage as far as a conjugal act, that there was nothing, you know, of that nature in the marriage. So to show that, we need to show that he was really old. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's a good intention for sure, right? But cannot young men be chaste? Oh, sure they can. Actually, it takes more virtue for a young man to be chaste than an old man. Now, again, no offense to any older men who are watching this, but you know what I mean, brothers, right? Especially when you're living with the most beautiful woman to ever walk the planet, you have to have a chaste heart. And so it's fascinating that actually, in all likelihood, he was a young man. And think of all the things that he had to do. You know, in my research, I discovered that, you know, uh, in 2000 years ago in Judaism, all men of able body had to walk to Jerusalem three times a year to fulfill certain rituals and, and, and ceremonies according to Judaism. Now, if St. Joseph did that, which he would have, and we know that he did because we see that in the life of the Holy family right there in the scriptures, um, three times a year, that's a three days walk one way. Let's say they did that for 25 years, probably more, but let's say they're just 25 years. The historians, the scholars have added it up. St. Joseph walked three-fourths of the way around the planet. That's a lot of walking, my friend. That's a lot of walking. So in all likelihood, he was a much younger man than he's been depicted as. I found that fascinating myself when I discovered that. I bet you also that many of you have heard, sometimes, you know, and I 
you know, as a convert, I've heard this myself from the pulpit that St. Joseph was a widow. Have you heard that? Now you can't, I can't hear your responses, but I bet many of you have. And probably you were told that he was a widow and he had children from a previous marriage. Hmm. Is that the teaching of the Catholic church? No, it is not. It never has been. And it never will be. It is not the teaching of the church. Well, then why is, why are people saying this, right? Well, again, these are legends, people trying to fill in the gap and just coming up with stories. There is no historicity to this at all. None. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true. So what do I mean by that? Well, the whole reason that people start talking about him being a widow and with children is because in the scriptures, in the New Testament, we hear about the brothers and sisters of Jesus, right? So many people in the first few centuries of the church, once the scriptures were set, said, uh-oh, well, how are we going to explain that one? Because we know that Mary, again, is a perpetual virgin. So they're not her children. Ah, here we go. He was a widow. Yes, that'll, well, that'll work, right? So we'll say that he was previously married and he brought those children into his marriage with Mary. But again, the Catholic Church has never taught that. Never been the teaching of the Catholic Church. Interesting. So they did it because they many people were not aware and they didn't know how to explain this, brothers and sisters, that in the ancient languages, when that term brothers and sisters was put in the New Testament, talking about the, the relatives of Jesus, it wasn't referring to the, the biological brothers and sisters of Jesus. Of course, Mary has no other children, but not even brothers and sisters from Joseph, children of Joseph. It was talking about cousins, but there was no word for cousins in Greek. And so they simply said brothers and sisters. And did you know that that still happens today? In many countries in Africa, in uh, many places in India, and even in certain islands in the South Pacific, all your relatives are called your brothers and sisters, but they're actually not your biological brothers and sisters. They might be cousins or nieces or nephews, but you call them brothers and sisters. Fascinating, huh? Yes. I dis When I discovered this, I was like, wow. I, sa I th said to myself, I think that tons of people need to be aware of this, even priests, so that they stop those homilies talking about Joseph being an old man and a widow with other children, because it's not true. It's not the teaching of the Catholic Church fascinating. So how did Joseph get into the New Testament at all? Think this through, my friends. Did Matthew and Luke, where, where Joseph is present in the New Testament, did they know St. Joseph? No, they did not. As a matter of fact, when Matthew and Luke were growing up, they were probably similar in age to Jesus, maybe even older. Who knows? They had no idea uh, 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 about Joseph. They never met him. He had died before the public ministry of our Lord and the calling of Matthew and Luke to follow Jesus. So they had no idea. Well, many scholars and saints throughout the ages have said that in all likelihood, it was the Blessed Virgin Mary, the spouse of St. Joseph, who, remember, after the resurrection and ascension of our Lord, she stayed with the early church. And she probably had discussions with Matthew and Luke that went something like this. Matthew. Yes, let me tell you about the time that my husband, St. Joseph, when we lost Jesus. Oh, Matthew, we were so distressed. We searched for him for three days. We were already away from Drew. We had to go back and we were so anxious, but we found him in the temple, Matthew. That's probably how these stories about St. Joseph got into the New Testament to begin with. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, but Our Lady championing her husband. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. Because as I go through this talk, you're going to learn about how she's doing it again. Like she did at the beginning of the church. Now, in these difficult times, Mary is again talking about St. Joseph and wanting us to pay attention to him. Okay, so throughout the centuries, right, um, there wasn't a lot that was developed about St. Joseph. Um, there were homilies, there were sermons, there was a few writings here and there. But there were some saints, extraordinary saints, who championed him and talked about him, wanted people to turn to him. Like, for example, St. Teresa of Avila in the 16th century. Oh, she was incredible. What a woman. What a woman. She helped reform the Carmelites. And for all of her reformed convents, she named them after St. Joseph. And she challenged people to a test of devotion because she was so confident in St. Joseph's intercession that when people questioned her on it, she said, I challenge you to try it for yourself. It's called St. Teresa's Test. 
uh, because she was so confident and she said she was never disappointed in the intercession of St. Joseph and many other saints. Oh, we could name so, so many. There's one uh, that I love who's not a saint yet. Maybe someday he will be, but he was a Dominican priest named Father Isidore de Isolanis. He's known to have written the first kind of theological treatise on St. Joseph. And this was centuries ago. He said, a prophecy actually, that in the future, the church would be going through a very difficult time, unparalleled in difficulty and turmoil and persecution, but that the church would do something wonderful to acknowledge St. Joseph and his dignity and his wonders, his privileges, his virtues, his titles, his honors, and the church would be victorious during this difficult time. Hmm, that's interesting, huh? Because I think you're going to see, and I, I don't have to really spell this one out for you, just turn on the TV, we're living in a very difficult time right now in the world and in the church. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on. So we get many others like St. Francis de Sales. Oh, probably some of the best homilies ever delivered uh, on St. Joseph were, were given by St. Francis de Sales. Uh, you get St. Alphonsus Liguori, doctor of the church. Incredible, incredible statements on, on St. Joseph. You get St. Peter Julian Imard. If you're unfamiliar with him, um, he's one of the most quoted saints that I have in, in my book. He loved the Eucharist and spread, uh, wanted to spread adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. But he also was in love with St. Joseph. And he wrote a book called The Month of St. Joseph. Uh, tremendous. And then you get Blessed William Joseph Chaminade. Probably not familiar with him, right? But wow, what a guy. He lived during the French Revolution, running from the authorities. And, and these were the, the leaders of this revolution were the ones who were taking nuns to the guillotine and burning down churches, right? Serious stuff. He was on the run from these people, and he was telling people to go to Mary and to Joseph to overcome, you know, uh, the, the poison that was in this revolution and so many others. But here's where we're going to shift into the second point of tonight's presentation. It wasn't until 1870, so relatively recently in church history, that something incredible happened in regard to St. Joseph. There was a pope, a very holy pope, Blessed Pius IX, who many people were writing to him at that time. This is the you know, late 19th century. And they were saying, Holy Father, we ask you to declare the doctrine of Mary's Immaculate Conception to be a dogma of the church. Now, what does that mean? A dogma is basically just a highlighter on doctrine. It's basically saying this is really important, especially for this current time. We really need to emphasize this, you know, because there was a lot of attack on, on life and on the human body and people were coming up with strange ideas. Well, people were petitioning the Pope, cardinals, bishops, priests, lay people, and they weren't doing it to say, Holy Father, do this, declare this, or we're going to come over there and beat you up. No, that's not what they were writing letters for, right? They were saying the people of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, really get a sense for this. Well, the Pope did it. He declared Mary to be uh, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception in 1854. Well, after that, there was a lot of other people that said, we also want something to happen for St. Joseph. So cardinals, bishops, priests, lay people were writing the Pope, the same Pope, and saying, Please, Holy Father, declare St. Joseph the patron of the universal church. And what does that mean? Well, the word patron comes from pater in Latin, which means father. Now, female saints are patrons as well, but in that sense, it means parental, right? So just like in Spanish, you say padres, and it refers to a mother and a father. So, but in this case, it's referring to St. Joseph as the father of the church. That's an extraordinary statement. So people were writing these letters, and, and, and the Holy Father was praying about it, but there was one letter written by a Dominican priest, a young Dominican priest named Father Jean-Joseph Lataste, who is now blessed Jean-Joseph Lataste. He wrote a letter to the Pope, and he said, Holy Father, I too ask you to do this for the good of the church, to declare St. Joseph the patron of the entire church. But not only that, right? Saints are go big or go home, right? So he had another petition in his letter. And it was that the Pope would put St. Joseph's name in the Mass. Now, my friends, I don't know if you're aware of this, but St. Joseph's name was not in the Mass at that point. The greatest of all prayers, the Holy Mass, 
did not have the name of Joseph in it. So this priest said, Holy Father, I will give my life, every sacrifice, every hardship, every difficulty, every cross I carry will be for this one purpose, to see St. Joseph declared the patron of the church and his name put in the mass. So two purposes, really. Well, the Holy Father was so inspired by that, that he said, that's it. This Dominican has so inspired me, I'm going to do it. At least one of them, patron of the church. And he did. He declared him the patron of the Universal Church in 1870. You know that Dominican priest died uh, one year later? He, he died. Very young priest. And now he's a blessed of the church. But the Pope did not put Joseph's name, St. Joseph's name in the Mass. He was uncertain about that one, right? The Mass at that point had been unchanged for centuries. So to put Joseph's name, oh boy, that could really, you know, shift things up here. We could really rock the boat here. So he said, we're going to have to maybe let somebody else do that one in the future if the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, inspires them to do it. So he didn't do that one. But after he put, declared St. Joseph the patron of the church, incredible things began to happen, my friends. A whole era, a time, an age of St. Joseph began that is unprecedented. As a matter of fact, there has been more to done to honor St. Joseph in the last 150 years, 1870 to 2021, so 151 years, than the previous 1,800 years of Christianity. Now, if you have the book, Consecration of St. Joseph, uh, great. If you don't, you know, you'll, I'm going to share some things with you in here, because in the introduction, I give like a timeline of some of these extraordinary things. Now, I want to read some of them to you because they're, they're amazing. So the Pope declared him the patron of the church in 1870. In 1871, the Josephites were founded, a religious community dedicated to St. Joseph. 1873, the Congregation of St. Joseph was founded, and many other congregations of St. Joseph were founded, women's communities, men's communities. Amazing. 1878, the Oblates of St. Joseph were founded, a wonderful religious community. And then, my friends, something extraordinary happened. In 1879, Saint Joseph came in an apparition. Yes, right. We we this is unheard of. Apparitions are usually Our Lady, you know, and usually to 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 young children, you know, in a field when it's raining or something. You know, this is just how it happens. You know, well, not this time. Oh, it was raining because guess where they came? Ireland. Our Lady came. Saint Joseph came. St. John the Evangelist came, you know, the, the, the beloved disciple, and a lamb, literally a lamb, depicting our Lord as the Lamb of God. Extraordinary. Now, in classic form, though, St. Joseph didn't say anything. <laughs> he didn't talk, right? But neither did any of the, the heavenly visitors. They didn't need to, because the people in Ireland at that time were going through a great famine. Oh, they were suffering. They were suffering. And so the mere presence of Our Lady, St. Joseph, St. John, gave comfort to these people. And this is an approved apparition. Our, we call it Our Lady of Knock, Ireland. But a lot of people forget about Joseph. He was there, and this is fully approved. Extraordinary, right? Never heard of anything like this. Well, after that, uh, the Pope, at the, the next Pope, Leo XIII, wrote the first what's called encyclical on St. Joseph. That's a really important papal document, really important. That happened in 1889. You know, I'm almost embarrassed to say this. It took the church 1,889 years to get an official document on St. Joseph. <laughs> wow, that's a long time, right? That's extraordinary to think about, right? So after that, great saints came to the, on the scene and began to promote St. Joseph by building shrines to St. Joseph. So in Spain, a woman named Blessed Petra of St. Joseph built a beautiful shrine to St. Joseph in the mountains in Barcelona and extraordinarily beautiful. St. John Paul II, when he beatified her, called Petra of St. Joseph the greatest apostle of St. Joseph of the 19th century. Now, you've probably never heard of her. Her stuff is still being translated, but an extraordinary, extraordinary woman. But the next person, I bet you probably have heard his name here in North America. A little humble brother who was not a priest, but a doorman for his community in Montreal, Canada, Andre Bessette. Oh, he had a great love for St. Joseph. 
And he began construction on what now is the world's largest shrine. It's a basilica dedicated to St. Joseph, the great oratory of St. Joseph in Montreal. It is the worldwide center for devotion to St. Joseph, just our northern neighbors in Canada. I've been there several times. What an edifice. It is extraordinary to see. And his body is there as well. St. Saint Andre Bessette now. After that, we get the approval of the Litany of St. Joseph in 1909 by St. Pope Pius X. Most people are familiar with the Litany of Loretto, which is Our Lady's Litany. Oh, it's a beautiful prayer. We learn Our Lady's titles. It's lovely. But now, just 100 years ago, we have a, 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 an analogous prayer, a litany, to St. Joseph, where we learn his titles, and it is powerful stuff. I love it so much that I actually made it the template for my book, so that when you do the program of consecration, you go through the litany every day and, and unpack it. After that, guess what happened? St. Joseph came again in another apparition. Now, you're probably thinking, he did? Where was that? Fatima, Portugal. Yes, right? We, we all know about Fatima. We've heard the, the three little children and, and all, all that happened there. But a lot of people forget, or maybe they never knew, that the three children all testified that on the final apparition, October 13th, 1917, that was the apparition, if you remember, where the sun was gyrating and spinning, this miracle of the sun, they called it. And 70,000 people saw this and they thought it was going to collide with the earth and life was over, right? But of course, that, that did not happen. But right after that, all three children said they saw St. Joseph holding the Christ child and together, father and son blessed the world. Joseph and Jesus blessed the world. That's kind of the forgotten aspect of the Fatima apparitions and the message of Fatima. Because remember, we're all longing for the triumph of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart, especially in these crazy times. We, we need Our Lady and the triumph big time. But we're never going to get it until we get the family right. The family is under attack today. Our Lady's heart is not going to rejoice and be jubilant when we have so much chaos in families today. No. As a matter of fact, Sister Lucia dos Santos, remember of those three Fatima visionaries, she's the one that lived to be like 100 years old. I think she only died in 2005. Um, she said on one occasion that the final battle between good and evil would be fought over marriage and the family. Mm -hmm. And we're definitely in that battle right now. And we need to bring in St. Joseph. He's the big guns on the battlefield. He, he's the spiritual father. He, he's incredible, right? And what he can do to usher in the triumph of his bride's heart, of our lady's heart, of his spouse's heart right? That's amazing. Okay. So then after that, I'm going to skip a few things here. Or we'll, we'll be here all night just going through this timeline. But after that, we get a new feast dedicated to St. Joseph in 1955, the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker on May 1st. Uh, that's an incredible one because at that time in mid 20th century, communism was a serious threat. Uh, and it was felt by world leaders. It was felt by the popes and they were really concerned. And May 1st was just May Day. It was a celebration of work. It wasn't a religious holiday. But the communists wanted to take it over and turn it into Communist Workers' Day. And the Pope at that time, uh, there was Pius XI and Pius XII. Well, Pius XII said, I declare May 1st the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker. And everything began to change. Communism began to, to, to dwindle away. And eventually, we know what happened under the pontificate of John Paul II. Major, major damage was done to communism. The sad thing is, is that it's still rearing its head today, but in different forms, right? You can call it socialism. You can call it whatever you want to. We There's different ideologies, say political ideologies, that want to destroy the dignity of the human person, the dignity of workers and their rights. And we need to call on St. Joseph again. We need him again in a big way. Okay, after that, we get um, something incredible. 1962, we finally get St. Joseph's name in the Mass. Finally. Now, how did this happen? This is extraordinary. I, don't, I won't give you the whole story because it's in the book and it's fascinating how it happened. Well, at that time, there was a Pope who, when he was elected to the papacy, his intention was to take the papal name Joseph. Did you know that we've never had a Pope Joseph before? Now, I don't mean like Joseph Ratzinger or, you know, no, not their birth name, but their papal name. We have never in the history of Christianity had a Pope Joseph. 
Not one. Well, this pope, when he was elected by the cardinals, his intention was to take Pope Joseph, and that would be his name. But praying about it, he so loved his father, his earthly father, his dad, and his name was John, that he said, I'm going to take John in honor of my father. And that's what he did. But there had already been 22 Pope Johns. So he took Pope John the 23rd. We almost had a Pope Joseph. Maybe in the future we'll get one. But it was that Pope who had such a love for St. Joseph that at the beginning of the Second Vatican Council, one of the first things that he did was to put St. Joseph's name into what was called and still is the canon of the Mass. At that time, there was only one Eucharistic prayer. Now there's four, but he put his name in that prayer, finally. And again, it only took the church 1,962 years to do it. <laughs> Does the church move slowly? You betcha, like molasses, right? I mean, that's a long time, but it's in there now. And his name is in all the Eucharistic prayers now. Pope Benedict XVI had intended to do it during his pontificate, and it was on his desk, so to speak, to sign off on. But as we know, he abdicated, resigned for the papacy, and Pope Francis ended up doing it as one of the first things that he did in his pontificate in 2013. So now we have St. Joseph's name in all the prayers of the Mass. Praise the Lord. Now, let's move into this third phase, the year of St. Joseph. Because my friends, this whole building momentum dedicated to St. Joseph um, is crescendoing right now because we have never had a year of St. Joseph in the history of the church. We are living in the first one. And I pretty much guarantee you, we're not going to get another one in our lifetime. Again, it only took the church 2,020 years to declare this one. So we need to really take advantage of this. And I want to read you a quote from St. Pope John the 23rd. It's a little long, but don't worry. It's an incredible quote. It's on page two. It's in the introduction in the book. This is what St. Pope John the 23rd said about this crescendoing of devotion to St. Joseph. He says, in the Holy Church's worship, right from the beginning, Jesus, the word of God made man, has enjoyed the adoration that belongs to him, incommunicable as the splendor of the substance of his father, a splendor reflected in the glory of his saints. From the earliest times, Mary, his mother, was close behind him in the pictures in the catacombs and the basilicas, where she was devoutly venerated as the Holy Mother of God. But Joseph, except for some slight sprinkling of references to him here and there in the writings of the fathers of the church, for long centuries remained in the background in his characteristic concealment, almost as a decorative figure in the overall picture of the Savior's life. It took time for devotion to him to go beyond those passing glances and take root in the hearts of the faithful and then surge forth in the form of special prayers and of a profound sense of trusting abandonment. Now I'm going to interject here and say, hmm, Sounds like total consecration to St. Joseph to me, right? All right, let me continue. The fervent joy of pouring forth these deepest feelings of the heart in so many impressive ways has been saved for modern times. That's a saint saying that, a pope saying that. Wow, we are living right now, my friends, in the first ever year of St. Joseph. Do you know what somebody like St. Teresa of Avila would have done to have lived at a time like this. Now, these times are difficult, for sure. But to live in a year of St. Joseph? What, what would St. Andre Bassett have given? Oh, what he would not have done to be blessed like we are. Now, they're in heaven. But we're living in this year of St. Joseph here in the church on earth, the church militant. What a grace. What a blessing for us. And what is this year? Why do we have it at all? As you know, I'm sure, the church throughout the centuries has celebrated Marian years, year of mercy we, we had re recently, year of prayer, year of faith, uh, year of St. Paul we had as well. So what's that all about? Well, basically it's saying that this is a special time to highlight this particular person or this particular theme 
uh, and have special conferences, events. Priests will gear some of their preaching towards this. Special liturgical celebrations, pilgrimages, indulgences can be given to the church in these special times. Well, now we have this one. But where did it come from? Did the Pope just wake up last year, December 8th, and say, oh, I don't know, I just feel like you know declaring a year of St. Joseph today. No, there's a context. There again, it comes out of somewhere. There were things going on in preparation for this. So let me share a few of those with you. So prior to the pontificate of St. John Paul II, to my knowledge, there was no one who had ever really requested or really thought about a year of St. Joseph, to my knowledge. Maybe it'll come out later and, you know, somebody in France or something, I don't know, but I've never heard of it. During the pontificate of St. John Paul II, that's when some initiatives began. Some people asked him, especially cardinals and bishops, to do this, but he didn't do it. And I know actually a lady who's very devoted to St. Joseph in Australia who wrote a letter to St. John Paul II during his pontificate asking him for this as well, but no response, nothing happened. He wrote a great document on St. Joseph. It's called Redemptoris Custos, Guardian of the Redeemer. Beautiful document. He greatly loved St. Joseph, but he didn't declare a year of St. Joseph. During the pontificate of Benedict XVI, again, cardinals, some cardinals, bishops, priests. I know of one in France. I know a good priest in South Carolina who also wrote letters to Benedict XVI uh, asking for this, but nothing happened. So when Pope Francis came on the scene, and he put St. Joseph's name in all the prayers of the Mass. One of the first things he did in 2013, people said, hmm, he seems to have a great devotion to St. Joseph. Maybe we could, should write those letters again. Well, some people did. Uh, and one community in particular, the Oblates of St. Joseph. Remember, I mentioned them in, in that little timeline I gave. I know those, those guys very well. They're great guys. And I said to them in 2018, Guys, you're having what's called a general chapter in Rome. Every religious community has this. About every six years they meet, make official decisions, new superiors are appointed, and very official things. I said, you know what? I know the Pope has to be aware of your community. You're a well-known community in, in, in Italy. Your founder is from Italy. Why don't you guys, in an official way, write a letter to the Pope asking him to declare a year of St. Joseph? And do it upright, you know, with official letterhead, put the seals on it and everything you got to do. So they made the decision at their chapter to do it. And they did in 2018. But nothing happened. So they decided to declare a year of St. Joseph for their own community. And they celebrated it worldwide. And it was wonderful. It was fantastic. God bless them. It was amazing. Well, it was during that time that I was writing my book, gathering all the information, traveled for three years gathering all this information about shrines to St. Joseph, religious communities, miracles, wonders, apparitions. And by the way, there's more than the two that I mentioned. It's, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, the saints, you know, what the blesseds have said, what mystics have said, like blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich and Venerable Mary of Agreda and so many others, incredible information. So I said to myself, you know what? We, we can't let this year of St. Joseph go. We've never had one. And I, I knew that my book was going to be published on January 1st, 2020. So I said, I really need to do this. So I wrote a letter to the Pope in English, but Pope Francis doesn't really know English that well. So I have a priest friend in Argentina because my community is in Argentina as well. And I said, Father Dante, can you translate my letter into churchy Spanish? I said, you know, and he said, yes. And he did. And then he said to me this, this was in, at May 1st. He said, Father, there's a bishop who's a good friend of mine from Argentina, who is in Rome right now. He's going to be meeting with the Pope tomorrow. He said, would you mind if I contact him and ask him if he will hand deliver your letter in Spanish to the Pope? And I said, absolutely. This would be fantastic. The bishop said yes. And so we immediately, I, I signed it. We sent it to him electronically. He printed it out. And he did. On May 2nd, 2019, this bishop, Bishop Hector Zordon from the Diocese of Gualiguachu, that's the name of the diocese in Argentina, he gave the letter to the Pope, and we have pictures of it. There's a group called the Servitoi Romano. They take pictures of, of these meetings with the Pope, and there they are talking about my letter. But I didn't hear anything right back. So I was like, ah, I know he got my letter because we got the pictures to prove it. 
But so I said, I know what I'll do. In the meantime, as I'm praying about it, I'll write to bishops in the United States asking them, would you, dear bishop, declare a year of St. Joseph for your diocese? Because they have that authority to do that. And many of them did. You know, up until December of last year, I, I had 12 bishops who, who, who said yes to this initiative and declared a year of St. Joseph for their diocese. I was so happy. Oh, delighted. I was, oh, you wouldn't believe how happy I was. But then, as you know, December 8th, last year, I woke up and my phone had so many messages on it, text messages, phone calls. I was like, what happened overnight here? And I looked at one of them from a friend who lives in Rome. Her name is Bree. And she said, are you in shock, Father? Can you believe it? And I was like, what? And I'm like, there were so many messages. There's no way I could read them quickly. So I wrote back and I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, he did it. He did it. And I'm like, he did what? The Holy Father declared a year of St. Joseph. What? I said, well, you've got to be kidding me. And sure enough, as I went through the message, I went on the internet and I started looking. He did, right? It caught the whole world by surprise, but he did it. And that's what we're living in right now. The first year of St. Joseph in the history of the church. But not only did he do that, he wrote an apostolic letter called Patris Corde, which means it's a beautiful title. What a beautiful title. It means with a father's heart. What a beautiful title for a document. And it's really easy to read. You know, it's if you print it out, it's about 13 pages. I, I encourage you to do that, actually. During this year of St. Joseph, you can Google it, put in... Don't even worry about the Latin. Just put in Holy Father's letter on Joseph, Pope Francis' letter. You'll find it. You'll be able to print it out. I'll read it. You don't have to print it out. Read it on the internet. Um, it's really nice, really good. But not only that, there's a certain organization in Rome at the Vatican called the Apostolic Penitentiary. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember when I first heard that term years ago, I thought, oh, that must be the slammer. <laughs> you know, that's jail. When you do something wrong at the Vatican, they throw you in the Apostolic Penitentiary. You <laughs> know, No, that's not what it is. It's an organization that grants certain privileges for things like this, especially indulgences. Well, they granted 16 ways to get a plenary indulgence during this year of St. Joseph. My friends, that is off the charts, mercy. We're practically being spoiled right now. With God is indulging us with so much love right now because of the difficulty of our times. And the emphasis of the Pope on the fatherhood of St. Joseph is critical. Critical. Could not have come at a better time. Why? Well, because right now we are experiencing in culture and families what you could call a patricide. That means killing of the fathers. Now, not literally, of course but figuratively. And what do I mean by that? Okay, let me give you some statistics that are shocking. This isn't Father Calloway making it up, fudging the facts. No, nope, these are facts. Ha more than half of all marriages today in the Western Hemisphere end in divorce. In one-fourth of the lives of children in families, so 25% of children today in the Western Hemisphere are not, do not have a father in their home. And in certain cultures, it's much higher. Some cultures, this is going to shock you, it's 70%. 70%. Wow. This is not good. We've got a serious issue going on. And if you look at sitcoms, for example, today, how are fathers and families portrayed? They're buffoons. They're fools. They have practically no intelligence. They're a man who just stumbles, can hardly even talk. He eats potato chips and he's, he's, he's a slouch on, on, on the couch, right? His wife makes fun of him and his own children laugh at him, mock him and ridicule him in front of their friends. He's the laughing stock of the family, the father. Last year, 2020, in a magazine called Parents Magazine. Now, don't subscribe to this, please. This magazine. Parents Magazine is the name of the magazine. How many fathers were pictured on the cover for 2020? None. Not one. Why? Because there's a killing of the fathers. This is not good. This is not good. We've got serious problems. So at a time like this, who would the Holy Trinity want to bring? Who would Our Lady want to champion right now? The great St. Joseph. Reserved for modern times. Because in centuries past, we didn't have these kind of divorce rates. We didn't have these kind of issues that we have today. I mean, think about it today. 
there's so much confusion when it comes to what is marriage. Most cultures and civilizations have put into law and redefined it. It's not even what it used to be anymore. By law, we're living in really, really messed up times. We need a good father. A father restores order. A father brings discipline, brings structure. And when things are crumbling down and falling down, if you've got a father who's a carpenter, even better. Well, we've got the best. We've got the man who's, who's, who's the mender of broken hearts. He fixes things. The great St. Joseph. This is the man, unlike any other man, that God obeyed. God doesn't obey men, except for two. Our Lady, as the mother of God, and our spiritual mother, and St. Joseph. God doesn't obey angels, but he obeyed Mary and Joseph as the parents of Jesus. That's extraordinary, right? You and I, we, we, we can't say what Our Lady and St. Joseph could say to Jesus. If I ever said a prayer that went like this, Jesus, my God and my son, call the bishop. I got problems, right? I need to go back to formation. <laughs> I went off somewhere. Jesus is not my son. He's not your son either, but he is the son of Mary and Joseph. That is extraordinary. And the power of that parental intercession is so great that we call Our Lady the mediatrix of all grace. And we call St. Joseph the mighty terror of demons. That's one of his official titles in the litany approved in 1909. Who knew, right? Who knew? And in this time in which we are living, in which boys, by the age they say now of 11 or 12, are exposed to hardcore pornography. This is the facts, not making it up. Boy, could we use an example of a man with a chaste heart, with the pure intentions, in this pornographic, filthy, perverse era in which we find ourselves. And that leads men so astray that it ruins marriages. Men treat women like objects, and they hurt them and harm them, emotionally, physically, or worse. We've seen this. We know this. It's happened everywhere. Sadly, even in the church on many different levels. We've got to repair this damage. And right now is the time of St. Joseph. Right now. The Holy Trinity, Our Lady, the Pope, so many in the church are saying, go to Joseph. He is going to help us in this crisis. He is going to help us in the difficulties that so many are experiencing in their marriages. Because I hear it all the time, my friends. I've been a priest 18 years now, and there's hardly a day that goes by when I don't hear somebody say to me, Father, pray for my marriage. Oh, my husband, I don't know if he's cheating on me or what the situation is, but it's just, it's terrible, Father. Or my children who, who hate the church, don't go to church. Father, I don't know what to do. I did everything right. I thought I did. We are in a serious situation. We need to go to St. Joseph. He is so amazing. I mean, think about this. I love to tell people this because we've never really thought this way, right? But it's so true if we just, you know, think it through. When God became man, took on human nature, and he wanted to share the, the countenance, the facial characteristics of one particular creature, he chose Our Lady because they're biologically linked, right? He lived in her holy womb for nine months. Well, I bet you in seeing Jesus, you're seeing Mary on some level, right? Just like I look like my mom. People tell me that all the time. I tell my mom that all the time. I bet you Jesus has maybe the cheekbones or the eye sockets or the chin or whatever, similar to, to, to his mother. That's how it works, right? Now, he doesn't look like St. Joseph because St. Joseph is not the biological father of Jesus. But you ever hear that phrase, like father, like son? It's true. And Joseph modeled manhood for the Messiah. That's incredible. So what does that mean? That when you see Jesus, you're seeing Joseph, not his countenance and similar features, no. But I bet you, almost guarantee you, that Jesus has the mannerisms, the accent. He walks like Joseph. He cuts wood like Joseph. All these things he learned from his earthly father. That's extraordinary. See, when God wants to look like somebody, he chose to have sim similarities to Our Lady. When God wants to 
be like somebody, when God wants to act like somebody, it was Joseph. Do you know how much that terrifies the devil and demons? Oh, it puts them jumping out windows. They're fleeing out of the scene because of that power. Why? Because all that St. Joseph has to do is make a request known to Jesus, consider it done. Just like Our Lady. Remember at the wedding feast of Cana, she technically didn't even ask for anything. She just made him aware. They have no wine. Boom! You got tons of wine. Imagine if Joseph makes a similar request or a situation known. Who's, Jesus is hearing it with the ears of a son. And oh, does he love his mother and does he love his father? Consider it done. The devil knows this, and that's why the devil does not want us going to either Our Lady or to St. Joseph. And if we get them together on this battlefield right now, the power is going to be extraordinary. St. Andre Bassett himself said that when Mary and Joseph pray together, powerful, powerful stuff. Yes, it is, my friends. And that's where we're going to get into the, the, the fourth aspect of this presentation tonight is the consecration to St. Joseph. Where does this come from? And why is it being championed today? And I mean really being championed. This is on the scene now, globally, worldwide. It's incredible. Just since this book came out, officially, January 1st of, of last year, we've sold half a million copies that we know of. That's just here in the United States. There's other press around the world printing it now in their languages, 15 languages it's available in. It's incredible, off the charts. There's ebooks, audiobooks, everything, and it just keeps going. The press can't even keep up with it. Almost every store is out of stock constantly. Why? Why do we need this right now? Well, again, about four years ago when I was putting the book together, I was so aware in prayer that the Holy Spirit was saying to me, you need to bring people to St. Joseph. There are so many wounds in hearts. And oftentimes, a lot of those wounds deal with men who have abused their authority and their strength. And they've hurt people, especially women. And there's a lot of wounds. There's a lot of people who don't want men in their life. They don't want fathers in their life. But you need to introduce them to the best of all men, outside of our Lord, of course, a good, good man who is sacrificial, who is loving, who is patient, who is kind, who is gentle. And yet he slays dragons with his mighty staff of purity. That's not the cane of an old man. That's the staff of a spiritual warrior in St. Joseph. You need to introduce people to him because they really have never known him. And so as I was putting the book together, I, I didn't know how to do it. How do I put all this information I've gathered on the pages and do I just do that and give it to people? Well, that's not going to be very presentable. So in my prayer, I remembered that there was a great book written by a great saint a few centuries ago, St. Louis de Montfort, who came up with a method of Marian consecration that went for 33 days. And I thought, that's really good. That's a good method. Because if I only give people like nine days, a traditional novena, that's good. But you're not going to be able to go total, really deep in just nine days. If I make it 90 days, three months, people are going to kill me. <laughs> They're going to be like, Father, what are you doing to me here? You know, it's too much. Right, it would be. 33 days a month, basically, perfect. So I thought, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here. I'll just imitate what this great saint did. So I gathered all the material, and then I had a problem. How do I still put it into these days? One day I'm praying the litany of St. Joseph, and I started to count the titles. And I almost counted 33. I was like, perfect. If I have an introduction, every day we unpack one of the titles, and then I supplement it with a secondary reading about uh, uh, an apparition or, 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 or a shrine dedicated to St. Joseph, and then the conclusion, there it is. And the things that I have in the book that I'm going to tell you a few just now to wet your whistle, so to speak, tease you so that if you don't have the book, you'll get a copy. Check this out. These are the things that I discovered, just a few. Did you know that the wedding ring that St. Joseph gave to Our Lady still exists? It's called the Santo Anello, the Holy Ring. It's in the cathedral in Perugia, Italy, in a gigantic reliquary exposed once a year by the Cardinal Archbishop for engaged couples and married couples to touch their ring to the Santo Anello. It's about 30 minutes from Assisi. Who knew? Yep, verified by the church and everything. Google it after this talk. You'll be able to see it. 
It's amazing, right? Did you know about the Holy House of Loretto? This is the family home of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph in Nazareth that was there until the 13th century. St. Francis of Assisi made a pilgrimage to see it. St. Helena, you know, the, the mother of Constantine had gone there to see it. But in the 13th century, all of a sudden, the house disappeared in thin air, gone. Nobody deconstructed it. You know, people would have seen that. It just disappeared. Amazing. And where did it go? It went to Croatia, right? <laughs> kind of random. It's like, huh, interesting. It appeared out of nowhere in a town in Croatia. And people wrote about it. So in the history books, a, a house appeared out of nowhere. And then it disappeared again within a year. Do you know where it appeared next? Italy, in a town called Loretto, where it remains today, the Holy House of Loretto. And do you know how it got there? This is affirmed by popes and official documents and so many saints. I have some in the book that have gone. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, we all love her. She, when she was going to Rome with her dad to meet with the pope to try and enter Carmel, she, they stopped there. And oh, how she described it. And so many others. Well, angels took it from Nazareth to Croatia, then to Italy, affirmed by popes. Now, why did they do this? Why even bother? Why not just leave it in Nazareth? Because six years later, Muslims came through Nazareth and destroyed the entire village. Had angels not taken it for safekeeping, it would have been in complete ruins. But it's been in Loretto, uh, Italy now since the 13th century. And you want to talk about a relic? This is like the mother of all relics. You know, this is where the Holy Family lived. They touched those walls. They ate within those walls. They slept in those walls. They prayed within those walls. I've been there once. I hope to go again. Powerful stuff. Amazing. Or, or how about, I'll just give you one more. How about the miraculous staircase that St. Joseph built in Santa Fe, New Mexico? You aware of that one? Amazing. I've been there twice, and the second time was just about three weeks ago. I was there uh, visiting it. This is 19, late 19th century. A group of nuns, sisters who had a school there, had a man build a chapel for them. But he did not build a ladder to get up to the loft. They just, he just assumed that they were going to use some kind of ladder to get up there, but you know, he didn't think. And then he died. He died shortly after building. So they were in a quandary. Okay, how do we, what do we do now? Well, they prayed a novena to St. Joseph. All of a sudden, a mysterious man with basically no equipment, he had a couple tools, no nails, nothing, nothing, shows up and says, I would build this for you if you just let me work on my own and in silence. And so that's what they did. This guy took several months to, to do what he did, and all of a sudden, gone. Never saw him again, disappeared. No idea who, who he even was. They went to the lumber yard to, to pay the bill. You know, what man? Nobody ever came here to get wood for, for a staircase. What are you talking about? We never, what are you talking about? They went and kind of analyzed the staircase. It's a spiral staircase, no nails, no center column. Architecturally engineering, it, it's like, how is this thing even standing? And it's still there today. That's amazing, right? Absolutely amazing. That and so many other things you're going to discover when you do this program. And I really want to encourage you. There are many ways that you can honor St. Joseph during this year. Many ways. You can honor him on Wednesdays. That's the day traditionally dedicated to St. Joseph. You can bring him into your joyful mysteries when you pray the rosary. Because remember, Joseph was in all of those mysteries. You can, uh, you know, do novenas to him. You can, you know, buy a beautiful statue of him for your home. All of these wonderful things. But a great way, a really great way is to do this program of consecration because you will come to know him in a way, I pretty much guarantee you, you have never known him before. And he is going to help you. All the fruit of this, the people that have been telling me what it's done for their marriage, what it's done for certain addictions. Oh, let me tell you about the men who have told me, Father, I have struggled with impurity for decades. I've done so many programs and done this and that to try and slay this beast. But now this has changed for me. I'm different. I'm, I'm, my, I feel it. Something has changed in me. And this delights my heart. You know, Joseph's name, etymologically, the root of his name, Joseph, it means increase. He is the increaser. He will increase your relationship with Jesus. He will increase your relationship with Mary. He will increase virtue in your life. And he will increase peace and hope. And don't we need hope today? We do. And, you know, in these difficult times when so many people, I, even I have family members who have lost their jobs. 
because of, you know, people being laid off of work. It's a very stressful, very anxious time. People worry, how am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to keep the roof over my family's, you know, head here? How, how am I going to do this? Oh, who's the patron saint of workers again? That's right. Saint Joseph. He is our go-to guy right now for everything. We need him right now more than we've ever needed him before. And so, my friends, I cannot encourage you enough to get a copy of the book, whether the paperback, ebook, audiobook, whatever. It's in Spanish here in the States. It's in other languages around the world, 15 of them. Get a copy and do it. There's a ton of people, I can't tell you, I know many of you are as well, doing it right now. But there's another group that's going to start on March 30th, ending on May 1st. I know many of you are going to be doing that as well. But you can do it anytime, right? A lot of people have asked me that. Father, can I, are there, can I only do it on these dates? No, you can do it anytime. I've even heard this, and I think this is lovely. I've heard husbands and wives doing it so that it ends on their anniversary. Isn't that lovely, right? As a way of renewing your marriage and, and giving yourselves to St. Joseph. I think that's absolutely fantastic to do something like that. And you can do it as a family. I know it's difficult right now to do it in parishes because of, you know, the whole social distancing and, you know, limitations and restrictions and so forth. But you can be creative on Zoom meetings and so forth. So many people are, are, are doing this. And I want you to pray for something because I've written another letter to the Pope, <laughs> right? Why not? The first one seemed to work. So we'll, we'll see if he reads this one. I asked him. And I just sent it on February the 11th, the Feast of Our Lady of Lords. I said, Holy Father, please, as an ongoing fruit of the year of St. Joseph, would you please declare January the 23rd, the Feast of the Holy Spouses on the Universal Liturgical Calendar? Now, why am I doing that? What am I talking about? Well, in my research, I discovered that there is a long tradition in a liturgical feast on January 23rd, celebrating the marriage of Mary and Joseph. It's not on the universal liturgical calendar, but certain places celebrate it, and they've done this for centuries uh, in religious communities, in shrines, in the Philippines they've done it, uh, places in Spain have done it, Montreal, Canada, the Oratory of St. Joseph has done it since it was founded, but a lot of people don't know about it. It would be great. In this time of confusion about marriage and attacks on family, let's elevate this feast and make it universal for the whole church. Holy Father, please do this. So let's pray that maybe the Holy Spirit would inspire him uh, to do that. I think it'd be a great ongoing fruit, an everlasting memory of the great year of St. Joseph, the first one ever, and we're living in it right now. So my friends, I really do. I'm going to give you a website uh, where you can get the book and you can see things associated with it. And by the way, I commissioned artwork as well to go with the book. You can see it in the back. Many of you already are aware of that. Really amazing paintings on St. Joseph from artists in Malta uh, and, and various other countries um, that really show him in such a strong way, in such a chivalrous way, in such a loving protector uh, way that it's, it's, it's quite, when you see the images, you're like, wow, I've never, never seen St. Joseph like that before. Pretty, pretty amazing. So the website, so the title is Consecration of St. Joseph. The website consecration to St. Joseph.org. Easy, right? Easy peasy. So if you go to that website, you can find out more. And I'm going to be praying for all of you because I know that uh, one of the reasons for this is to get you excited uh, to do it and, and to prepare for doing it. Uh, and I'm going to be praying for you. That is my promise to you. Um, I prayed for the book. I made a novena to every saint, blessed, venerable, and servant of God who's quoted in the book. That took me one year to do. The book is saturated with prayer. It drips with prayer, of, with what I put into it, because I wanted souls to really be touched to come and know St. Joseph. So I'm going to continue to pray for every person who is doing this consecration that you would benefit from it greatly, that you would be given peace, that you would be given hope, that there would be healings, that there would be such a re restoration in your life that it'd be something like you've never experienced before. That's my promise to you, my friends. And so I'm going to give you a priestly blessing now. Heavenly Father, through the intercession of our Lady, our dear Mother Mary, and the great Saint Joseph, the pillar of families, the guardian of virgins, the glory of domestic life, the mighty terror of demons, I pray for his paternal cloak over all my friends here and their families. 
praying for their intentions, for conversions, especially of those who are away from the faith, that through the intercession of St. Joseph, that they would come back, that they would fall in love with you, Jesus. And in these difficult times, they would be given hope and peace and know that you love them. And I give this blessing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you, Father Cowley. And I know while we're muted, we can certainly give a little round of applause wherever that we are. Uh, thank you for, for sharing and for sharing your talents as well. Um, just real briefly to, to your point, you beat me to it. So uh, this is the website Father Calloway was speaking of, uh, consecration to St. Joseph.org. So it's kind of a, a one-stop clearing house, if you will, on all things Joseph, not only to uh, get the book consecration, if you haven't received it already, to see the arts and the gifts that he was discussing, um, as well as the endorsements to the consecration and other works that he has done as well. So we certainly encourage you to visit consecrationstjoseph.org during this time. Additionally, to know more, you can visit uh, the uh, fatheroverdiocese.org, our website, not only for different events that are upcoming, including like the Virtual Women and Men's Conference in a couple of weeks uh, in March, which will feature the Bishop and Valmar Jensen, but also it will allow you to um, see here what we are currently offering for the year of St. Joseph, uh, not only Bishop de Cunha's invitation uh, to perform the consecration, uh, but also other information which Father Kyle has talked about, resources for the family, uh, and other talks. And we want to point you to the fact of on March 19th, the Solemnity of St. Joseph, uh, Bishop Editor de Cunha will be celebrating a Mass at the Cathedral of St. Mary's. It will also be live-streamed, as well as a, a Mass for the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker on May 1st. Uh, and while uh, many of you might already be doing the consecration that began February 15th for um May uh, uh, for March 19th, which is wonderful. Uh, if you didn't, that's okay. As a diocese, we're inviting individuals to begin on March 30th, as Father Cowley pointed out, for May 1st. And that May 1st Mass will include the prayer of consecration with Bishop Cunha um, for the diocese and for, for all of us. Uh, so once again, thank you all for joining us, Father Cowley. Thank you for your time. Uh, and thank you all for coming tonight. Have a good night.